Manassas Foundation. Welcome to The Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, L.A. and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holdengraber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello. Hello, could I please speak with Jeffrey Sterling? Hello, oh, speaking. Hello, Jeffrey. This is Paul, Paul Holdengraber, calling you from the quarantine tapes. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. No, thank you. Tell me, Jeffrey, how have you been spending these last seven months of this delirious moment in our history? I'm just trying to figure out uh, what's next, uh, where to go next. Uh, it's kind of, I know it's been a tough time for everyone. I'm certainly not unique in that, but... Um, trying to get back into the workforce after uh, being in prison for a while makes it even more difficult uh, to find work. So it's been, um, I feel like I'm still transitioning. Uh, I think because of COVID, it's uh, sort of extended right. that transition period for me. Right. And, and, and yeah. precisely in, 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 your, uh, in your book, Unwanted Spy, you yes. write the following about when you received the guilty verdict. And I'd like you to, to tell us about that guilty verdict for what, when, mm -hmm. and why. I'd finally gotten an answer to the question I'd been wondering about my whole life. What does my country really think of me? Can you bring us back to that moment as, 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 as graphically nearly as you can and give us a quick yeah. sense of what led to it? When, what, why? Yeah, it, uh, you know, that moment was, uh, I mean, it's depicted standing before the judge and jury waiting for a, a verdict, uh, waiting for what your future, what your fate is, is certainly... Uh, depicted a lot in movies and even in books, but experiencing it yourself, it was highly profound. And of course, the waiting up to that moment is was horrible in itself. Mm. And for me, the, the biggest question that came from it and the biggest, just big unknown for me was what was it all about? What was that trial all about? There was yes. no evidence of me doing anything. I certainly didn't commit any crime that I was being alleged of, to have committed and absolutely no evidence but the only thing that was proven beyond a reasonable doubt in that trial was that I was black and that was enough to convict me and that really for me personified all of the other struggles that I had gone through it's like where do I fit you know, am I for me it was a battle or a journey through black America and white America and, you know, that trial was the epitome of what white America thought of me and, and how it viewed me. You know, you're guilty. Um, we didn't prove anything that you did other than the color of your skin. And that's enough. And for me, that just said, well, my country thinks of me as nothing more than, you know, a pigment. Uh, and not having the same rights or the same uh, capabilities as anyone else other than to be a defendant or a criminal. And this is where you belong and this is where we're going to put you um, and where we feel this is the badge you will wear guilty. And it was it was horrible. Um, there was uh, eight, uh, nine uh, counts of guilty. I only heard the first. And after that, I could, all I could hear was my wife behind me sitting in the gallery crying. And um, because I knew what the rest were going to be with that first one. So it was it was highly profound, not only just from the, the standpoint of standing in that courtroom and the experience in that courtroom, but also just the epitome of my entire, it felt like my entire life, my entire journey. 
In the end, um, you were convicted under the Espionage Act. Yes. Forgive me for such a naive question, but mm. what is the Espionage Act quite exactly? And can you give us a sense of its, I mean, briefly, of course, of its history and the ways in which it's been recently used? It's certainly an old law. As a matter of fact, it's usually described as being ancient. Uh, I believe it was early 1900s the law was created. Um, and to go after and to punish spies, individuals spying against the United States. Um, and to me, I mean, the name itself denotes what its purpose was, you know, Espionage Act, those who committing espionage against the United States. There's only been a few uh, individuals tried under the Espionage Act. Uh, I think we can go back to the uh, Goldbergs, I believe. Right. Um, and you know, so not, not many instances of individuals being tried pr prior to recent administrations of the individuals being tried under the Espionage Act. Now it's turned into more of a, a hammer uh, by the Justice Department and presidential administrations to go after, as they say, whistleblower uh, leakers. Uh, but in fact, it's being used to target whistleblowers. It's being used to target individuals who may have had the audacity to stand up and say no to government wrongdoing. Uh, and so in, in, in what we have is not individuals who are committing espionage, but individuals who are trying to bring to light the wrongdoings in government. Yeah, you, um, you, you write about that beautifully. You say yeah. whistleblowing is not about the whistleblower. It's about the yeah. information that the public is interested in and should be educated about, about wrongdoings in our government. So in, in a sense, what should people be thinking about when they think about whistleblowers? What is it that this term, in a sense, Jeffrey, obscures? I think w the, the problem that happens is that, as you, as you said, you know, the term whistleblower, who's defining it? Uh, the individual who is uh, maybe at the, is the subject of the whistleblower's report is the individual who's in, usually in charge of defining. And they don't define the individuals as whistleblowers, they define them as leakers. Of course, someone who has done something wrong is not going to um, you know, admit to the value of someone bringing forth uh, information about wrongdoing. And I think what people should bear in mind is, you know, who is defining the individual or what was, was talked about? If they're focusing on the individual, and that's just distraction away from the overall issue. Um, and I think what people should understand about whistleblowers is that they're Americans who love and care for their country just like anyone else and have chosen to take a very risky uh, step to say no and to stand up against the powers that be. And I think if people start to understand that a little more, Maybe there was to be uh, some additional accountability for our politicians, our leaders in government to really uh, give some substance to the protections that whistleblowers deserve. In that context, how concerned are you about the precedents being set in the government's case against Julian Assange? Uh, I, I think the precedent there is, is so dangerous. And, and what is really troubling is how the mainstream media has basically, in this country, have basically ignored the extradition proceedings uh, with Mr. Assange. Um, the, the, writing, the handwriting is on the wall there. I mean, that the government, our government, is going to use the Espionage Act to go after not only those individuals they consider leakers or, or spies, if you will, but also journalists and media who may report that information. And how mainstream media can just ignore this issue is beyond me. I guess they feel they have such a, a position of, I guess, importance or a cozy position with the powers that be that they think they will never be targeted as such. Uh, maybe they think there is such a difference between, say, ABC News and Julian Assange that uh, they're not concerned. I think it's a false sense of security. And for me, it's, you know, I feel a bit of personal responsibility 
uh, for what is happening with Mr. Assange. Uh, because with my trial, there was an appeal during my trial, the entire process, it took so many years, where the government wanted to be able to call the reporter to make him testify about his source. Well, the initial judge wouldn't let them, so they appealed. And the Fourth Circuit ruled that there is no journalist source protection. And I think up to that point, it had been a gray area whether the, whether the government would actually go after uh, reporters or media outlets. And I think the Fourth Circuit in that appeal related to my case forever said, OK, there's, you know, remove that gray area. And it's and then it was only a point to whether what administration was going to be the administration to put a reporter on the stand and potentially throw them in jail for not if, you know, to reveal their source. If I had been successful in defending against the ludicrous charges against me, then maybe that gray area would still be there. And then maybe these actions against Mr. Assange may not be taking place. Maybe he'd be a free man today. Maybe. But maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe. And, and in a sense, what I'm hearing is, is beyond responsibility, uh, a sense of guilt, Jeffrey, but, yeah. but you can't, yeah. but you can't. Yeah. And then I, I, you know, reality hits in is that I was being, Tried being charged under the Espionage Act is an impossible endeavor to to undertake. Um, there is you're hamstrung to defend yourself. You're hamstrung in knowing what the government's case is. Um, the government doesn't have to prove anything. All they have to do is say this person did this. Uh, you'll be tried in the, the Fourth Circuit in Virginia, which is you know in my case the CIA's backyard. Um, they don't have to produce any evidence to prove you guilty. Uh, so it was an impossible task, but, but you know, I was a lawyer. And so, yeah, yeah. But still, but still, I, I, yeah. I imagine. And this was the, the, the reporter you're referring to is Jeffrey Risen. James. Uh, James, James Risen. Uh, James yeah. Risen, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, you know, and... Uh, that was an instance of the government. Okay, just oh, there was a relationship with this and Jeffrey Sterling and a reporter, because Mr. Risen had written an article about my discrimination suit against the CIA, and they automatically made the leap that okay, there was an operation I was involved in that I obviously told Mr. Risen about. Though they established during the trial that I revealed no classified information for that article about my discrimination suit and then prove, provided no evidence that I didn't you know, um, divulge any classified information for the information that he put in his book. So it was just you know, guilt by association sort of thing. And how many of us have associations with those in the press going down whatever level you want? Uh, the government can take that and use it against you and prove you a spy. Jeffrey, can you bring us back to your very early days at the CIA and to the conversation you had with a black veteran of the agency? Yeah. Yeah, when I joined, I, I tell you, that was one of the proudest moments for me, uh, joining the CIA. Um, I was so proud of joining that I would purposely walk around front to walk in the front doors to walk across the, the emblem in the lobby that I'm sure people have seen in movies and TV shows. But when I first got there, um, started getting indications that, you know, this dream come true could possibly turn into a nightmare. A black associate, uh, in the employee at the agency, uh, came up to me and asked me why I was there. And I immediately took offense to that. Um, you know, he, he continued, he was saying, you know, there's so many other things a young black man could do. Why are you here? I, I, I took offense at that as I, well, wait a minute, you're here. Why can't I, why can't I be wherever I want to be if I'm capable and I have the ability to be someplace and be chosen to work someplace in particular, why shouldn't I be there? And uh, again, I said, I was, I was, I was taken aback and I was insult. I felt insulted by that, but his message was there. And even though I didn't want to believe it, it was that it's going to be tough for you 
you, you would have more value and a better experience somewhere else because this is not a place for black people. But I felt that I was not going to be hindered or, or reduced to only areas that black people are supposed to go. I, I, I'm sorry about that. I, I felt like I had as much a right to be there as he did. And evidently he had been there for years. Uh, so why couldn't I have a start there as well? And maybe prove him wrong with his viewpoint on how African Americans are treated at the CIA. If if somebody now came to you wanting to join the CIA, what would you say to them? Um, I'd say it's a wonderful career. I, I would also say you know, it's a wonderful way to serve your country. But I would also say go in it with your eyes open. Um, it is a closed world. It, it is a world unique and you know, unique into itself. And when I joined the agency, and I've said this to people during my book tour, that you know, I knew I had educated myself on the history of the agency. And I, I didn't go in with uh, rose-colored glasses on. I knew this was an organization that has had a troubled past. But I also felt that maybe I can instill change. Maybe I can be a spark of you know, decency Uh, for that, for the organization. And because, and the only reason I felt that maybe that could be is because just my over my overall motto in life, which is to thy own self be true uh, from my favorite author, Shakespeare, just that I knew nothing was going to change me. I was going to do what I thought was right for me. And I was going to be myself and not let whatever situation in life change me. So maybe I could bring something to that organization. What, uh, remi but, remind me what the emblem of the CIA says. Uh, oh, it has been so long. <laughs> uh, uh, well, the one motto on the, on the wall is uh, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right. Um, in the lobby. And I always felt that was kind of ironic. Mm, ironic. Very ironic um, because it's, again, it goes, well, what truth are you talking about? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and you, you educated yourself, as you said, about the CIA. But did you, did you know this? In, in, in your book, you describe learning Farsi and studying Iranian yeah. culture. And you write, and I will quote you, the more I read, the more I realized that most of my colleagues at the agency knew nothing about the place. Few people at the Absolutely. CIA could have told you that the Taj Mahal in India is a perfect example of Persian architecture. Few of them would have known of Oman Kayyam was of significance in Persian literature. In fact, my colleagues expressed no interest in learning about Iranian culture or society, Absolutely. dismissing the entire country as a bunch of dangerous, foaming at the mouth, ragheads who would do anything for a few dollars. How? How do you explain this provincialism and what do you think its consequences have been in geopolitics? I think it's um, arrogance, uh, the feeling, and, and I will just to be blunt, American arrogance, that we are the best in everything in the world and anyone who doesn't agree with us is wrong and we don't need to know about you. Um, I was really, again, uh, as you read from my book, I was shocked. Yeah, that there is not only that there was ignorance about it, but there was no interest in even learning about these cultures. When I joined the agency, there wasn't really a push for me to learn a language. I was determined when I joined. It's like I'm going to learn a language, um, you know, a language out there in the world that can be useful. Uh, you know, that was my. It wasn't in, encouraged uh, many times. They said, "Well, you don't need to know the language. Uh, the only." language that you need to know is dollar. Uh, pay someone and they'll do whatever you want. And I, I think that's a wrong headedness about, you know, an, an American wrong headedness about the power of money. Mm. Um, and so, and just the feeling that our culture is the culture of the world and all the cultures are just, uh, you know, serfs, uh, they're, they're peasants, uh, they're of no consequence in the world. And such a rich history in Iran that I learned when I was there, it took on myself to learn, and it helped me know more 
about Iranians. You know, that was very helpful for me when I was with the Iranian task force. Of course. I was able to, I was able to go to places that other officers were not of course. because I had a sense. And also because I didn't look like the typical CIA agent. <laughs> You know, I, I, I always think that 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 line that Americans learn geography by going to war yeah. Has, yeah, absolutely. has some truth. You recently quoted from your favorite, as you call him, scribe, Shakespeare, mm -hmm. in The Tempest, yeah. a reference to police killings of unarmed black and men and women. And you, you quote this line, oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. Can you, can you say more about this and how perhaps you are living this trauma in a different way than many, many other people today? Well, it's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's been a lifelong suffering, you know, seeing it, hearing it. Uh, when I was a child, uh, my brother, who unfortunately had issues with drugs, he was just ranting and rambling in the street. And she, my mother, you know, her cries, him to come inside because someone had called the police and her screaming, you know, they're going to kill him. You know, that, that was me as a child and that hasn't changed. And, you know, that suffering continues and, I, and seeing it, you know, the innovations of cell phones and people being able to take videos have revealed so much of what has been there for years and years and years. To many, it's new, but to many of us, like myself, It's been the same thing over and over and over again. And I do suffer every time I see you know, a black American in this country being brutalized, murdered by police. And it really is, and it struck home once again. I, I live in the St. Louis area. So when the events in Ferguson happened, you know, I wanted to be there to take part in some of the protests. But at that point in time, I was, um, you know, on the verge of going to trial uh, and being watched by pretrial services and things like that. So I, I couldn't extend myself out that way. But th that pain, you know, suffering in his body laying there riddled with bullets and laying in the street for, I believe, three hours. And then the many other instances that have happened even since then, even when I was in prison in New Orleans, uh, an individual was selling CDs and I, he was shot by police. I, they said he had a gun and things like that, but just, just shot him like his life didn't matter. And his last name was Sterling. And that struck me again, you know, even more. And it's, You know, it is a it is a suffering. I see them suffer, and I'm suffering along with them. I would hope that America in general is suffering. Black America, some of Black America, is feeling that suffering. Uh, but it should be the entire country, and that's a that's, that's a suffering unto itself as well. That these the atrocities are not being recognized as they are. Um, And it, yeah, it hurts whenever in this latest instance with the police shooting in Philadelphia, I saw a news blurb, um, someone from the Philadelphia police stated that the reason they didn't tase the individual was that they didn't have the budget for tasers. And that hurt as well. And so you're bringing it down to a cost effective equation. It is more cost effective to shoot to kill than to use a taser to possibly save a life. And that's where black people are in this country. And that suffering continues. You wrote an extraordinary piece, uh, Jeffrey Sterling, called Whistleblowing the Pandemic and a Law and Order System of Injustice. And you, you quote uh, Martin Luther K uh, King on the complicity of the white moderate. And that, yes. and that made me think of a, an extraordinary moment of um, James Baldwin in an interview where he asks, how much do you want for your progress? Yes. I'm going to play it. It's about mm -hmm. 25 seconds long, and I just want you to react. Okay. What is it you wanted me to reconcile myself to? I was born here almost 60 years ago. 
I'm not going to live another 60 years. You always told me it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time, my nieces and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? That, that, to me, that's incredible. Um, very profound. Uh, that, that is the white moderate in 20 seconds. Um, the weight. Uh, it, ta- it takes time. It takes time for the white moderate. It takes lives for you know, the African American. Um, their time is measured in our lives. And uh, that time is more valuable than a black life. And that, that's what is disturbing. And, you know, two of the most influential people in my life, Martin Luther King and James Baldwin, essentially saying the same thing. And I, I revisited the uh, letter uh, from a Birmingham jail while I was in prison. Mm-hmm. And you, know, you, you get a different impression of writings in particular at different stages in your life. And I was struck once again by just how right Dr. King was with regard to the white moderate uh, who, who will say, take time, you know, just wait, just it takes time and is really enforcing the law and order state. And that law and order generally comes down upon the heads of black people in this country. And, you know, it's all the same. And so we're dying. And, and then Baldwin accentuates that. You know, how long do you want me to wait? Yeah. How long are we supposed to wait? For your progress. And for their progress. And is that progress? It, it, it's progress for them, because, you know, for the white moderate, because you don't have to do anything. But on the other hand, I mean, the opposite of that progress is death and subjugation by the African-Americans in this country. And I, I mean, enough is enough. I mean, we, and this president, uh, this so amazing, uh, a president who blatantly you know, encourages, you know, fuels the fire of white supremacists in this country um, yeah. to the professed shock of white moderates, but, um, you know, quiet support uh, that they provide him. And it, it's amazing to me. I mean, things won't change if no one wants to change them. And the white moderates don't want to change anything. So I just... There's so much that needs to be done in this country. Maybe this election will cause some change. Um, maybe not. <laughs> but again, with what is actually happening in this country being shown to Americans, maybe that can spark some change or continue to spark some change. In that same article in closing, you write, what is necessary is nothing less than a complete dismantling of an irreparable system of justice. How do you see an organization like the CIA fitting into that system? It has to be completely changed. I I do believe there is a need for intelligence agency, for an intelligence agency in this country, but it needs to be called into account. It needs to be accountable for its actions. It needs to be accountable to the citizens it is in charge with protecting. And if that means tearing down the traditions, uh, the, the, the accepted notions of that agency and the individuals that work there, then that is necessary to be done. Until that happens, that organization will continue as it does. It sits up on a mighty hill. And I, I also tell people, when was the last time you heard a politician say, I'm going to clean up the CIA? None do that. It's been decades since anyone has even touched upon that topic. So if we can get some accountability, I mean, that in itself and not behind uh, classified uh, budgets, uh, classified programs and things like that, but complete openness of this organization. And that can only be done if those in power start calling that organization into account. And that's the kind of revolution that... Because that is revolutionary, I think, with regard to, and the CIA would certainly view it that way. But a completely overturning of a system is necessary. And that has to be done, I believe, with our intelligence uh, uh, apparatus and certainly our justice system. Uh, It has to completely, on, on all levels, 
it just has to be completely overturned into something workable, something new, something accountable, and something that all people in this country can respect and be proud of. Jeffrey Sterling, it's been a, a real pleasure uh, speaking with you. I really thank you for your candid words. And thank I, you. I really wish you well and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, thank you. You too. Bye bye. Take care. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support. Thank you.